Hi, I'm Carol Stivers, and I'd like to thank Jean for giving me the chance to tell you more about the characters in my debut science fiction novel, The Mother Code. And here's the book. The Mother Code begins in 2049, when a bioweapon gun awry puts the survival of the human race at risk. In response, children who are genetically engineered to survive the threat are placed in the care of large-scale robots. The story centers on a boy named Kai, but includes others of the children, as well as a group of adult survivors who created them and are now trying to ensure their safety, if only from afar. I first had the idea for the Mother Code while traveling in the desert southwest with my family in 2003. I find that area of the country to be so evocative, the sheer beauty of it in contrast with the challenges it poses to the survival of life. I had been watching Japanese mecha anime with my daughter and I became fascinated with the idea of a child living inside one of those giant robots surviving in this desert. I was especially intrigued with the idea of a human inter uh, machine interface between a child and his bot, inspired by books like The Future of the Mind by Michio Kaku and mecha anime classics like Neon Genesis Evangelion. At the heart of the story, I wanted there to be a reliance by the child on his mother robot because so far as he knew, there was no other life left on the planet. The rest of the story, the origins of the pandemic that set the stage, the origins of the mothers and their children, the conflict that arose as the children and their mothers matured and changed, and a few human adults who remained afterward to shepherd the children, all grew out of that original idea. But who would populate my world? Though I always start thinking of a novel in terms of its plot, I do love coming up with characters to act out my stories. And for The Mother Code, my cast of characters was huge. When I was asked to come up with a character list in preparation for the production of the Random House audiobook, I came up with a list of 40 characters, only five of whom had no dialogue. Twelve of those were children, 27 were adults, and one was a robot. Eight including the robot, spoke with distinctive dialects. Like many writers, I typically base my characters on people I have met or on amalgams of those people. But when I was approached by Hollywood about adapting the Mother Code, I got to fantasizing about who might play my characters on screen. In the end, I even used some of those ideas to flesh out my characters during final edits. So just for fun, I'd like to play a game with casting as I introduce you to the pivotal characters of the Mother Code. First off is Rose McBride, played in my mind by Bryce Dallas Howard. Uh, Rose is a computer programmer slash psychologist slash army captain who's put in charge of a project to program robots capable of mothering human children. <clears throat> She's the one who invents the mother code, a code fed into each of the mother robots that allows them to emulate the human mother of the child they carry. Here's an excerpt from the book in Rose's voice. May 2052. In the late afternoon gloom of her Presidio office, Rose McBride sat back, massaging her temples with her fingertips. New dawn. At times, she wished she'd never heard of it, because hearing of it meant knowing everything else. In one way or another, she'd been involved with this project since December of 49, but she'd been on the outside with no possibility of seeing in. Over a year spent tracking mysterious microbes, followed by nine months negotiating the relocation of the non-government occupants of the Presidio, hadn't prepared her for the truth she'd learned at that first Los Alamos meeting six months ago. She'd learned that human life on Earth was facing annihilation. She'd learned that it would be her job to imagine what would happen afterward. And she'd learned that if her projections about the inexorable spread of infected archaebacteria were true, this would be her final mission. The proper way to train military robots to care for newborns in a post-apocalyptic world hadn't been part of the course curriculum at Princeton. But given everything that was happening, the rapid spread of the infection, the failure so far to develop a working antidote that might save more than a few souls, it had somehow begun to make sense. She had to admit it. The robotic option had to be considered. And Rick Blevins had been right in choosing her to develop the program, for she couldn't stop thinking about it imagining it. She called it the mother code, a computer code meant to embody the very essence of motherhood. Next up is Rick Blevins, mentioned in the uh, passage that I just read. Rick is played by Steve Carell, 
not the naive Steve Carell from the 40-year-old virgin, or the daffy self-absorbed nerd that he plays in the office. More like the Steve Carell from Space Force, but with the tortured, opinionated edge of his character in The Morning Show. Rick is a former Special Forces man, now an injured Army colonel relegated to a desk job. He gives the thumbs down to a plan to use a novel bioweapon in the deserts of Afghanistan, only to find out later that the weapon has already been deployed and it will be his responsibility to clean up the mess. So here's a passage in Rick's uh, point of view. Rick Blevins powered up his computer and settled into his chair. As he waited for his secure length to boot up, he ran the palm of his hand down the length of his thigh, massaging the place just above the knee where the prosthesis joined what remained of his right leg. He winced. The adjustment to this new device was proving difficult. Like his old one, the bulk of the new prosthesis was covered with a synthetic mesh that stiffened and softened as he moved, mirroring the softness or stiffness of the tissues in his upper thigh. Its bionic muscles were controlled via the same electrodes connected to his own nerve tissue. But his, but this new appendage, built for better mobility, seemed to have a mind of its own. When he snapped it into place each morning, tiny pinpricks of energy surged upward through his spine, a force like something alien. He stared out the window. The weather wasn't helping. The previous night's freezing rain had painted the concrete facade of the Pentagon with a thin layer of frost. Running his hand over his scalp, he felt the stiff growth of his thick brown hair. He needed a cut. He was startled by the buzz of the intercom at his lapel. We need you down here, came a clipped male voice. Down here was General Blankenship's basement office. Rick gulped coffee from his thermocup and straightened his tie. He was pretty sure he knew what this was about. A month prior, he'd been summoned for comment on a biowarfare project at Fort Detrick. The project was called Tabula Rasa, a moniker that was frightening enough. But as he'd rescanned the section labeled Expected Impact, he'd felt his heart skip a beat. Rather than offering the expected rubber stamp on the program, he'd fired off a salvo advising its cancellation, sending uncharacterized bioweapons out into the world even to the most remote parts of the world, was crazy. But now, he was sure the vehemence of his response hadn't gone unnoticed. No doubt Blankenship had been dissatisfied. As he caught the elevator and traveled the three floors down, he steeled himself for the inevitable reprimand. Next we have James Saeed, played in my mind by the spectacular Riz Ahmed. James is a middle-aged cell biologist, He's, he was raised in a secular household by his Pakistani parents in Bakersfield, California, and he pronounces his own name, said, as in he said, she said. All he wants out of life is to climb the academic ladder to success, until one day he gets a call from his government. And here's a segment in James's point of view. Urgent, confidential, Department of Defense. Dr. Saeed, request your presence at a conference to be held at CIA headquarters Langley, VA. December 20, 2049, 1100 hours. Top priority. Transportation will be provided. Please respond ASAP. General Joseph Blankenship, U.S. Army. James Saeed removed his wrist phone ocular from his right eye, tucking it into its plastic case. He peeled his flex phone from his wrist, then undid his belt and loaded along with his shoes and jacket onto the conveyor. Eyes focused straight ahead toward the optical scanner. He shuffled past the cordon of airport inspection bots, their thin white arms moving efficiently over every portion of his anatomy. Urgent, confidential. When it came to communications from the military, he'd learned to gloss over terms that he'd once found alarming. Still, he couldn't help but steal a glance around the security area, thoroughly expecting a man in military blues to materialize. Blankenship. Where had he heard that name? He ran his fingers over his chin. That morning he'd shaved close, exposing the dark birthmark just below the jaw, the place where his mother told him Allah had kissed him on the day he was born. Did his looks betray him? He thought not. Born in California on the 4th of July, his every habit scrupulously secular. He was as American as he could be. He possessed his mother's light skin coloring, her father's tall stature. Yet somehow, the moment he set foot in an airport, he felt like the enemy. As the last of the bots offered him a green light, he gathered up his belongings, then pressed his thumb to the keyboard on the door leading out to the gates. In the bright light and bustle of the concourse, he slid the ocular back into his eye and secured the phone on his wrist. 
Blinking three times to reconnect the two devices, he pressed reply on the phone's control panel and murmured into it, Flying to California for the holidays. Must reschedule after January 5. Please provide agenda. In line at the coffee stand, he refreshed his phone feed. He smiled at the sight of his mother's name. The harvest is in. We are ready for the new year. When will you arrive? Swiping the phone's small screen with a long index finger, he located his airline reservation and tacked it onto a reply. See attached, he dictated. Tell Dad not to worry about picking me up. I'll catch an autocab. Can't wait to see you. And then there's Kai, a child genetically engineered by James Saeed to be immune to the bioweapon and birthed by a robot mother in the desert. Since kids change so quickly, I hadn't thought of an actor to play Kai. But he was modeled after my own nephew, Jack, who was about the same age as I was writing the novel. Though James may consider Kai to be his own child in a way, we later find that Kai has an even deeper bond with someone else entirely. Here's a segment in Kai's point of view. June 2060. Kai could feel the morning heat spilling through Rosie's hatch cover, flooding his cocoon. As he rubbed the sleep from his eyes, his fingers touched the small bump on his forehead, the rough place where the chip was embedded just under the skin. Your chip is special, Rosie had told him. It is our bond. It was how they knew one another, she said. It was how she spoke to him, except during his speech lessons she never used her audible voice. He reached out to touch the smooth surface of the hatch cover in front of him. Where his fingers made contact, the transparent surface became opaque. An image appeared, a group of men with sun-weathered skin, colorful woven robes draped over their stooped shoulders. Rosie had been teaching him a lesson about people who lived in the desert, a desert much like his, but on the other side of the earth and very long ago. The men in the image, Rosie said, were the keepers of the scrolls, ancient writings like those unearthed from caves over a hundred years before the epidemic. What's that, he asked, pointing to one of the men. Perched atop the man's forehead, a small box was supported by a thin leather strap. Rosie's familiar soft buzz and click filled his mind as she accessed the required information. These were called tefillin. Each contained four tiny scrolls on which were written passages from, taken from a book called the Torah. Beneath her console, her servo motors whirred gently. This book described a set of beliefs that they lived by. You teach me through my tefillin, Kai said, pointing to his own dusty forehead, the chip encased there. Are you my Torah? Rosie paused. She was thinking, compiling her answer as she often did when he asked a difficult question. No, she said. The information that I provide is based purely on fact. It's important to separate beliefs from facts. Withdrawing his hand from the screen, Kai watched the image disappear. He peered through the hatch cover, once more transparent. Outside, the familiar rock formations surrounding their encampment stood firm, their massive red fingers pointing skyward. They were strong like rosy, undaunted by wind and heat. He pressed the latch to his left, the sun's heat assailing him as the hatch door swung open. He scrambled down over Rosie's treads to reach the ground, coming face to face with his own reflection in the pocked mirror of her metallic surface. His skin was tanned and freckled, streaked with dust. A cloud of reddish-brown hair framed his head, and blue eyes twinkled from beneath heavy lashes. Somewhere, Rosie said, there were other children, others like him, but different. And finally, there's Rosie, the mother robot at the heart of my story. Rosie is not at all humanoid. She's more like a super soldier who can fly as well as navigate on land. She has a laser, for gosh sakes. So here, if you'll pardon my poor artwork, I've drawn a cartoon of what I think Rosie would look like if uh, she's sitting on Earth. Here's the screen that Kai was uh, looking at in the scene I read. Here's her hatch door where he climbs out and her retractable treads. She has ducted fans for short takeoff and landing, and uh, she has wings that are here uh, gathered up along her back. I do hope a film gets made so that we can see how the talented folks in the movie world will render my mother robots. So that's it for five of my top characters. I do hope you'll read the book so you can get to know the other 35. I didn't even have time to talk about my personal favorite adult, Kendra Jenkins, whom I dream will be played by my favorite comedian, Wanda Sykes, or my favorite child, Misha, who appears halfway through the story to steal the show. 
I really loved creating these characters, and I do hope you'll love reading about them. <laughs>